Welcome to The Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. Today's episode is brought to you by the financial support of our listeners. Uh, thank you so much uh, for your support. You can support the show at support.greatdetectives.net. Uh, now it's time for today's uh, episode of Sherlock Holmes with special guest star Orson Welles, The Final Problem. The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes. We present the original stories of the late Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, dramatized anew with Sir John Gilgood as Sherlock Holmes, Sir Ralph Richardson as Dr. Watson, and today, Orson Welles as Professor Moriarty. It is with a heavy heart that I come before you with the last adventure of my friend Sherlock Holmes that I shall be able to relate. I have tried in my humble way to chronicle some of our exploits together to demonstrate the singular gifts of that most remarkable of men. It lies with me now to tell you what occurred between Holmes and his arch enemy, Professor Moriarty, when at last they came face to face. Mr. Sherlock Holmes, your efforts on the side of law and order have seriously inconvenienced me. The situation between us is becoming an impossible one, Mr. Holmes. It simply cannot go on. One or the other of us must die. Must die, Mr. Holmes. It was in the spring of 1891... You will remember, perhaps, that after my marriage and return to private practice, Holmes and I had drifted apart a little. I followed the newspaper reports of his cases, of course, and called on him quite often at the old rooms in Baker Street. Even so, however, many weeks would sometimes elapse between our meetings. And so, it was with some surprise, one April evening, that I looked up and saw him standing before me in my study. Good evening, Watson. Ah, good evening, Holmes. Have you a cigarette for me? Holmes, it... Great heavens, man, how ill you look. Oh, I dare say I've been using myself up rather too freely of late, old friend. You've no objection if I close your window shutters? No, of course not. You're not afraid of anything, are you? Well, to tell you the truth, I am, rather. Well, it's not like you, Holmes. What is it? Air guns. Air guns? What on earth do you mean? There's a new and deadly type of air gun, Watson, which has been specially designed by an old acquaintance of ours. Who? What, Professor Moriarty? It can only be he from your tone. The same. A match. Give me a match, will you, my dear fellow? Yes, of course. Oh, thank you. Is uh, Mrs. Watson at home? No, no. She, she's on a visit to an aunt. Oh, I'm good. quite alone. Good, good. That makes it easier for me to propose that you should come away with me for a few days. Oh, delighted. (laughs) But where? Oh, the continent. Somewhere abroad. Huh? Abroad? Yeah, is that whiskey in the decanter there? Yes. Now, look here, Holmes. What's all this about? 
There's something more serious in your manner than... Uh, you never did quite believe in the iniquities of Moriarty, did you, Watson? You've said so more than once. <laughs> I felt you exaggerated a bit. After all, Professor Moriarty is a respectable figure in public life. Just so, and that's the very genius of the man. Even you, Watson, knowing me as you do, can't quite believe me when I tell you that he corrupts all London with his evil influence. Oh, I can't quite believe that. Oh, of course, to the world he's still the professor, the great mathematician. He's respectable. But what real proof have you that he's anything else? None. Well, at least... Not until this last month. And even now the chain isn't quite complete. But three days more, and I shall have him, Watson. Three days more, if I live to see them. You can't seriously suppose that your life's in danger, Holmes? No. Oh, you always love to be melodramatic. Melodramatic? Listen, Watson, this morning, this very morning... In those old rooms of ours in Baker Street, I saw him face to face. I spoke to him. Moriarty? Your distinguished professor. Within him, a criminal strain of the most diabolical kind. That great white dome of a forehead, those hooded eyes, and the white face pushed forward, oscillating from side to side like a snake. Oh, of course, if you believe the old heresy of physiognomy... It isn't only that, of course not. I've worked for years to follow a thousand different threads, and every one of them has led to Moriarty. He's the Napoleon of crime, Watson, the secret organizer of almost everything evil that goes undetected in this great city of ours. There he sits motionless like a spider in the center of its web, a web with a thousand strands, and he controls them, every one. But slowly, very slowly, my own secret plans to expose him have borne fruit. Every day my net is drawing tighter, and he knows it, Watson. He knows the danger he's in, and that was why today he came to see me. I was playing my violin, as you know I often do when I want to think, and suddenly there he was, standing in the doorway, with his white face swaying in that evil way, peering at me with his hooded eyes. Good morning. Professor Moriarty, good morning to you. Mr. Sherlock Holmes, I believe. How very charmingly you play. How kind of you to say so. Mm -hmm. Won't you be seated, Professor Moriarty? I can spare you just five minutes. This is singularly good of you, thank you. I will sit down. <clears throat> May I say something personal, Mr. Holmes? Certainly. Well, I'm surprised to discover that you have rather less cranial development than... One might have expected. Uh, well, as you, on the contrary, have rather more than I had imagined, Professor. Uh, you will recollect, I am sure, however, that Beethoven's outdid us both. <laughs> however, our personal characteristics are hardly relevant to the present situation. What have you really got to say to me? Uh, well, perhaps I only suggested, of course, perhaps it is a dangerous habit to finger loaded firearms in the pocket of one's dressing gown, Mr. Holmes. Ah, uh, evidently you share that dangerous habit, Professor. I see that you keep your hand in the pocket of your morning coat. <laughs> Supposing we lay our pistols and our cards on the table. By all means. I was about to suggest it myself. Ah, I see you favor the Mauser type, Mr. Holmes, and without a silencer. You must permit me to present you sometime with one of these small devices of my own design. They're quite convenient in avoiding unpleasant noise, you know. How very kind of you, Professor. You must ask the hangman to deliver it to me as your last request. You evidently don't know me, Mr. Holmes. On the contrary, I think I know you better than you know yourself. I wouldn't take up your gun again, Professor. I've already got you covered with mine. So I perceive, but I assure you it was only to give a harmless demonstration. Of the silencer? Of my own small accomplishments as a marksman, Mr. Holmes. Oh. I've read in those accounts of Dr. Watson, that somewhat bovine... I but, beg your pardon? Uh, no doubt amiable friend of yours, that those marks on the wall there are made from your indoor revolver practice. Quite so. The initials there, V.R., Victoria, Regina, God save Her Majesty. Now that I see them, it seems perhaps they're not quite as symmetrical as they might be. One side of the V is a little short, I think. Permit me to correct the slip. Admirable, Professor Moriarty. You were perfectly right, of course. That little mistake has now been rectified. I would like, however, if I may, to improve upon it. Your bullet mark is perhaps a shade smaller than my own. Permit me... Admirable, Mr. Holmes. Yes, precisely. 
Above your own mark, Professor, the exact spot, I think. No, no, pray don't look alarmed. My good landlady is quite accustomed to that noise. We shall not be disturbed. I'm very glad of it, for what I have to say is not without importance, Mr. Holmes. Shall we stop our fencing and begin? By all means, if you will permit me first to correct one statement that you made just now. Well, sir? With reference to my friend Dr. Watson. I'm afraid I can hardly permit the adjective bovine. Oh. In his accounts of my humble exploits... He's been good enough to exaggerate my own achievements and has always been unduly modest about his own. He is a most upright and honorable gentleman, Professor, and very close to my heart. You may say what you will about me, but I can allow no derogatory words about him. Very well, Mr. Holmes. I apologize. We who are about to die salute him. At least you do. You're very certain, aren't you, Professor Moriarty, that it is I who am going to die? There is no other course. Unless you listen to reason. The situation between us, Mr. Holmes, is becoming an impossible one. It simply cannot go on. It won't, I assure you. For these past few months, I've been working to put an end to it all at the earliest possible moment. And you have very nearly undone the careful endeavor of a lifetime, sir. Or at least have seriously threatened it. No, 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 no don't move to your pistol again. I'm only taking out my memorandum book. Oh, I beg your pardon. I find it recorded here... And you crossed my path on the 4th of January, Holmes. On the 23rd, you incommoded me. By the middle of February, I was seriously inconvenienced by you. At the end of March, I was absolutely hampered. And now at the close of April, I find myself placed in such a position, through your continual persecution, that I'm in positive danger of losing my liberty. That was certainly the end I had in view. Then you must drop it, Mr. Holmes. You really must, you know. Not till after Monday, Professor... You know as well as I do that you've made a slip, one single tiny slip. For years I've been aware of you, Moriarty, at the center of your organization. Forgeries, murder cases, robberies. A thousand crimes were planned by you. A hundred agents carried them out. Your subordinates were caught sometimes, but you never were. And yet, you know, you made that slip. That single, tiny slip. And you know as well as I do that it will destroy you. In three more days, my evidence will be complete. I shall have you exposed, brought to trial, condemned, and hanged. And you can do nothing whatever to prevent it. My will is inflexible. And so is mine. Three days, do you say? And before they're out, the end will come. One or the other of us must die, sir. Quite so. The five minutes is up, Professor, and I must really ask you to excuse me. In the pleasure of our conversation, I'm afraid that I've neglected business of importance elsewhere. Very well, then. Seems a pity, Mr. Holmes, that I've done what I could. I admit that it's been an intellectual pleasure, me to see the way in which you grappled with this affair, but I tell you solemnly, Sherlock Holmes, that if you are clever enough to bring destruction on me... You may rest assured that I shall do as much to you. You have paid me several compliments during this interview, Professor. Let me pay you one in return when I say that if I were assured of the former eventuality, I would most cheerfully accept the latter. I can promise you the one but not the other. Good day, Mr. Holmes. Oh, your pistol, Professor. You may need it before Monday. Thank you. Good day, Professor. I think goodbye is the word, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Goodbye. And so it was, you see, Watson, that singular interview with the greatest criminal of all time. And his with the greatest detective. Oh, thank you, my dear fellow. But, but what are you going to do, Holmes? I told you, we leave for the continent. Moriarty is not the man to let the grass grow under his feet. Already one or two accidents have nearly befallen me today. Upon myself? Yes. The police are gathering all my evidence against him. Everything will be complete in three short days. Meanwhile, I can only lie low. Uh, are you able to leave your practice to come with me? Mm, well, I have an accommodating neighbor. Ah, oh, dear Watson, I knew I could count on you. All right, then. Now, these are your instructions. Listen most carefully. Instructions, Holmes? I assure you they are most necessary. 
Tomorrow morning at 8.45, you will take a handsome cab. I'll arrange for one to call. No, no, you really must obey me to the letter, Watson. You'll leave the house alone tomorrow morning and take neither the first nor the second cab which presents itself at the rank. Very well, Holmes. Hand the address to the cabman written on a slip of paper and tell him not to throw it away. And I'll drive, I take it, to Victoria Station. On the contrary, you drive to the strand end of the Lowther Arcade. I see. And then? Have your fare ready, and the instant your cab stops, pay him and dash through the arcade, timing yourself to reach the other side at exactly a quarter past nine. Yes, but my dear Holmes... Now listen, I... man, listen carefully, it's vital. Our lives depend upon it. When you get there, you'll find a brougham standing close to the curb, driven by a fellow with a black cloak tipped with red. Say nothing. Simply jump in, and he'll drive you to Victoria in time for the Continental Express. And where shall I meet you, Holmes? A second coach from the front of the train, a first-class carriage reserved for us. Good night, Watson. And as you value our lives, don't forget a single word of my instructions. No, 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 of course not, Holmes. Until we meet tomorrow, then. Until we meet... I was infected myself with something of his own inner excitement and sense of menace. I took the hansom and then the brougham with its massive hooded driver. I said nothing to him as I was instructed and he never spoke to me. A moment later we were rattling to the station. There he left me and drove off without a further glance, his face still hidden. There was no sign of Holmes, and my heart sank miserably. I found our reserved carriage, but through some confusion, a decrepit old Italian priest was sitting there. The moment came for departure. And still, I waited by the window in a chill of fear. Scusa, signor. Pray go. Yeah, I'm sorry, Padre. Can... I don't speak Italian. Nor do I, Walter. Oh, good. Good. <laughs> Heavens, Holmes! <laughs> no, quiet, you. quiet, man. This is no laughing matter. Not yet, anyway. There. You see? Stop! Stop the train! It's Moriarty himself. The tall man? He'll never do it. Stop the train, I say! Let me go, you fool! All you are in you! Let me go! Even the great Moriarty himself is helpless against the British railway system, Watson. Well, well, it gives us an hour's respite, at least. But how, how did he know where we were? By watching you, I expect. But I did everything you told me. Uh, wait, Holmes, the driver of the brougham. Well, what about him? He was muffled. I didn't see his face. It must have been one of Moriarty's men. My dear Watson, it was nothing of the sort. It was my brother Mycroft, shaken for once out of his armchair at the Diogenes Club. Poor heavens. The thing is serious, then. Of course. But at least we have an hour, and I can use it to take off this disguise and think things over. But we've escaped him altogether, surely, since the train connects with the boat. My dear fellow, you evidently don't realize even now that Moriarty is an opponent on practically the same intellectual plane as myself. Do you really imagine that if I were the pursuer, I would permit myself to be baffled by so slight an obstacle as an express train? What'll he do, then? What I should do, engage a special. But it'll be too late, even then. By no means. We stop at Canterbury, don't forget. And then there's always a delay of a quarter of an hour when the train gets to Dover. Oh, my soul, you'd almost think we were the criminals to be chased like this? You mean that he'll catch us after all, then? I hope not. We shan't be there, Watson. <laughs> look, look here, Holmes. I, I hate to grumble after all this time, but... Really, I do think you ought to tell me what you mean. Heaven bless you for a stout and faithful friend, Watson. I'm sorry. It's only that... Well? Well, I don't want to expose you to danger, too. That's why I'm being so mysterious. It's very simple, really. We shall just get out at Canterbury. Indeed. And not go on the continent after all, I suppose. Oh, yes, we must do that. We've no choice but to hide away until after Monday, when the evidence will have been completed. You've not seen the papers this morning, I suppose. Oh, really, Holmes? What time do you think I've had for that? <laughs> One must try to make time for everything, Watson. You really should have read about Baker Street. Hmm? What? Baker Street? Yes, they set fire to our rooms last night. Mrs. Hudson was away from home, fortunately, and no one was hurt, I'm glad to say. They thought I was there, of course. Oh, my soul, the thing's intolerable, Holmes. Yes, only till Monday, Watson, and by then we'll be in Switzerland... We'll make a cross-country journey from Canterbury and take the other boat from New Haven to Dieppe. Uh, unless, of course... What? 
our friend the professor deduces what I would deduce and gets off at Canterbury himself, ah, that would truly be a coup de maître. He surely never would. Well, I rather doubt it. There are limits even to his intelligence. No, no, I think we are safe enough, old friend. And now there's time for a pipe, I fancy. Won't you join me, Watson? And thus it befell. As we hid behind a pile of luggage at Canterbury, we saw the single carriage of the special go thundering past us. And so we made our way across country and at last reached Switzerland. It seemed we had eluded him. To fill in every detail of the final scene is hardly possible since there was no witness to it. Yet, from a certain source that I cannot yet divulge, I do know something of that last encounter. We wandered at our will through the lovely valley of the Rhone and made our way by way of Interlaken to the little township of Mirigan among the Alps. The fatal Monday came and went. And yet I was still aware of a strange febrile excitement in my companion. He was at times feverishly on the alert, then sinking into reverie and would smile strangely to himself. I went with him on that last day of all, on a visit to the falls of Reichenbach, forever hallowed and yet cursed in my memory. It's a fearful place indeed, with a torrent plunging far below into a tremendous abyss, a chasm lined by coal black glistening rock. High above, a pathway has been cut in the cliff face to afford a better view, but it ends abruptly in midair, and the traveler has to return as he came. We stood there, giddily marveling at the great spectacle. And on the instant came a message for me by a village lad to say that an English lady back at the hotel was seriously ill and needed my immediate attention. I turned to go. I looked back and I saw Holmes leaning against a rock with his arms folded, gazing down at the rush of the waters. It was the last I saw. Is that you, Watson? Back already? Well, Moriarty. Well, Sherlock Holmes. You see, I found you after all. And alone. Alone, as indeed you must be too. Now that your confederates are all under lock and key, I've mm -hmm. heard from Scotland Yard. I escaped. I was too clever for them, Holmes. I don't doubt it. But I'm afraid your occupation's gone, Professor, with your organization destroyed, unless you care to return to your mathematics. It was not my intention. I have another and more immediate intention, Sherlock Holmes. Are you prepared? Well, before we discuss that, perhaps you extend me one small courtesy, Professor. No, certainly. What is it? My friend Watson, Professor. No doubt he will be somewhat concerned... Uh, may I just take a moment to scribble a note to him? Oh, certainly. We can fix the paper beneath my alpen stuck there so that it does not blow away. Pray take as long as you wish. That's very good of you. Please don't stop talking, Professor. I mastered long ago the art of writing and conversing at the same time. Thank you. You know, of course, that the message to write for Dr. Watson was a false one. Oh, yes, of course. I knew it at once. And that it could only come from one source. And yet you let him go? Yes, Professor, I let him go. I am not without some affection for him. I did not wish to put his life in danger, too. Besides... Besides? I have looked forward for a long time to this final duel between us. I believe it, Holmes. You are a very remarkable man. In many ways. Many, many ways, sir. I'm proud to have known you. Oh, and I, you, Professor. There, my letter's done, then. Perhaps you'll be kind enough to place it, as you suggested. Right. Now, how shall it be, Moriarty? I did not bring a pistol, Holmes. Thank you. 
Your courtesy puts me to shame, Professor. Here is my pistol. It goes into the falls. Hand to hand? Yes. Goodbye, Professor Moriarty. Goodbye, Sherlock Holmes. The end, the end. When I returned to that broken pathway, it was only too clear what had happened. It needed no great application of Holmes' own methods of deduction. Two sets of footsteps to the verge, and none returning. Locked in each other's arms as they fought, they had gone down to the abyss. Only the letter... The last greeting from my friend and comrade. My dear, dear Watson, he wrote. My dear, dear Watson, I scribble this through the courtesy of Professor Moriarty, who awaits my convenience for the final discussion of those eternal questions which lie before us. There can be but one outcome, although I fear that it is at a cost which will give pain to my friends, and especially, my dear Watson, to you. I think, however, that I may go so far as to say that I have not lived entirely in vain. Pray tell Inspector Patterson that the papers which he needs for a full conviction of the Moriarty gang are in pigeonhole M. Before leaving England, I made every disposition of my property and handed it over to my brother Mycroft. Pray give my affectionate greetings to Mrs. Watson and remember me as I used to be in our old days at Baker Street pacing to and fro with my violin and driving you to a point of sad distraction with that theme you still were good enough to say you loved. Believe me to be my very dear good fellow, yours most sincerely, Sherlock Holmes. Yours most sincerely, Sherlock Holmes. And so he perished whom I shall ever regard as the best and wisest man that I have ever known. The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes, based on the original stories of the late Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, dramatized anew by John Keir Cross, stars Sir John Gilgood as Sherlock Holmes, Sir Ralph Richardson as Dr. Watson, and today, Orson Welles as Professor Moriarty. Produced by Harry Allen Towers. Welcome back. Uh, I have to be honest that uh, I listened to this episode. Uh, actually, it's one of the first ones when I was considering uh, whether we would do this particular uh, Sherlock Holmes series, and I almost uh, decided not to do it. Um, and trying to think of what I don't like about this story uh, or uh, I think the big thing um, that that was an issue to me is this feels uh, this feels more uh, staged. It could be the lack of uh, lack of a supporting uh, cast at all. Uh, you basically throughout the whole thing you've got uh, Holmes, Watson, and Moriarty, uh, and as the feeling of a three man play. 
rather than a typical radio drama. And I don't know, the other thing I think that did um, was that uh, Holmes and Moriarty were just ridiculously polite to one another. Now, some of this uh, comes from the book, but, um, you know, when you're hearing it on the radio... Yeah, you know, it was a pleasure to know you. It was a pleasure to know you too, Moriarty. Of course, the uh, Sherlock Holmes story it's based on is, uh, in many ways, far from perfect. The main uh, thrust of the story was to simply uh, kill off Sherlock Holmes and end the demand for new stories on uh, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. This attempt, of course, was uh, ultimately unsuccessful, uh, but that was the basic point of the story. As such, uh, Moriarty was originally written as a sort of uh, plot device. I will say that uh, I enjoyed the uh, original story, despite its flaws, and the Granada television uh, adaptation more. But uh, we have one more week uh, for the series, the final episode. You'll want to be sure and tune in next Thursday as we wrap up the uh, Gilgood Richardson series and our uh, performance of uh, Sherlock Holmes radio plays. On the bright side, we should have plenty of uh, Sherlock Holmes video uh, specials in the future, but last two uh, radio plays, uh, next week's the last one, so want to be sure and listen to that. In the meanwhile, I'll send your comments to Box13 at GreatDetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter, Radio Detectives, and uh, become one of our friends on Facebook, Facebook.com slash Radio Detectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.